Hey Gearheads, it's Jeff with Gear Report here with another Philmont Scout Ranch backpacking gear rundown. This is a post-trek review of everything I carried on our June 2021 trek to Philmont Scout Ranch. Is anyone not ready? Trek on. That was a good one. a little different than you'll find on some channels where they lay everything out on a neat table and it's all in rows and they just talk about stuff. That's only part of the puzzle. The other part is how you carry the stuff around. Organization in the backcountry goes a long way towards helping you get in and out of your camps more quickly, which leaves more time for taking in the amazing scenery and the cool programs in the backcountry at the various different staff camps at Philmont. So, Let's start out, I'll tell you the order we're gonna go through this. How to get your stuff to Philmont. We'll talk about the stuff that you wear when you go on the trail, the stuff you carry on the outside of your pack, the stuff you carry on the inside of your pack. We might even get into tents and dining flies and that kind of stuff as well. Hey, this is your chance to be internet famous. Yeah. Ooh, internet only famous. Be internet famous. What if I fall, I'll be more popular, right? That's what I'm saying. Yes, there was an assumption there that you fall in a spectacular manner, not just... Something that I did not carry, but I want to show you, is the Gear Report and Suncoast Wilderness First Aid Backpack First Aid Kit. This is something we collaborated on with North American Rescue, one of the premier real medical service provider companies out there. I mean, you can get first aid kits from anyone. Some of them are just band-aids thrown together. This is like a legit high-level EMT combat medic type company at North American Rescue that has higher quality products that are screened and you know, you're not getting any Chinese crap in these. And honestly, they're pretty affordable as well. This is designed to be a crew first aid kit for a Philmont Trek. It's purpose designed by Sal at Suncoast Wilderness First Aid down in the Tampa, Florida area. So that's a little collaboration between Gear Report, Suncoast, and North American Rescue. This was in our crew gear that one of the scouts carried. And you can see it was open. Not much was used out of it, fortunately. All right, let's see what else we have in here. In the top, I would typically have the next meal that we were gonna need would be sitting right on top. So Philmont meals are all prepackaged in a little food bag. This one says breakfast 09. They're numbered one through 10. Uh, this is a breakfast 07. All of the food bags are made for two people. So you would have a meal buddy, basically. So Scott and I were meal buddies. When food was issued, here's another organization tip for you. When the food is issued, split it into your meal buddy pair. So Scott and I got all of our meals and we lined them up. So if it started at breakfast 07, we'd have breakfast 07, lunch 07, dinner 07. And then we'd have breakfast, lunch, and dinner 08, breakfast, lunch, and dinner 09 for however many days, typically three to four days you're picking up meals for. We'd get those all lined up in a row and then go, you get one, I get one, you get one, I get one, down through the line. So we split them in half and we were using them in order so that as we went through the trek, each of our bags would be getting lighter with each meal. We put all of those, so I'd get all my meals, and Scott, would, Scott put all his in a blue bag. I put all mine in one of the big, uh, in a bag like this, in a big, like two, two and a half gallon Ziploc type freezer bag. And again, with my name and expedition number on it. So then we get to a camp, I pull my smellables out from here, I pull my food bag out, put both of those in the respective piles for the bear bags, and I'm done. And then when the bear bags come down and we're packing up in the morning, super easy. I know a lot of crews just throw all the meals together and everyone grabs some, and I don't understand that. To me, it's easier to sort it out once and then you, you put everything in the right order so you use it in the order as you take it out. 
when the bear bags come down, you just grab the one with your name on it, toss it in your bag. There's no sorting, there's no guessing, there's no digging through everyone's bag to see where did that extra meal go. You know, hey, we can't find this one. They're all organized and ready to go. Since I'm not on the trail and don't have Philmont meals, I don't have that bag anymore. This one actually has something that I carried but didn't use much of. A Hydro Pack, this is a two liter bottle. We did use some. Uh, I used the three liter bottle in one of the side pouches the first couple days. Uh, but then we had some extras in case we needed more capacity for dry camps. So here is a four liter Hydro Pack bottle that we didn't actually use and a six liter dromedary bag, a drum light bag actually, that we didn't use. We could have if we needed it, but as it turned out, our last couple days, we had two dry camps back to back. So we had lots of extra water carrying capacity. Turned out that a spring that's normally dry coming into one of our last dry camps on Tooth Ridge, Schaefer's past spring, I've never seen it running. It was actually running pretty well uh, when we went by. So we were able to fill up water there. It is the thing of legend, the thing that everyone has heard of, but no one has actually seen. The Schaefer's Pass Spring, springing right in front of us. Wow. It is. We knew that was running from some folks that had come down the day before. So before we left Clark's Fork, we didn't fill this extra 10 liters of water up. We could have, but we knew we could get water up there at uh, Schaefer's Pass, so we didn't need to take it. But any of these soft side water containers are absolutely fantastic in that they weigh next to nothing, an ounce or two, and then they give you a pretty large water carrying capacity. And since they're flexible, you just roll them up and tuck them somewhere. You don't have to worry about them taking up a lot of space, like if you were carrying 10 now jeans, for example, that would be much heavier and take up much more space in your pack. So these I kept in a Ziploc, really just for organization. And I use a Ziploc instead of a some sort of stuff sack because I can see through it and tell what's in it. And just makes it easier when I'm moving things around. <laughs> also in a Ziploc, we had toilet paper, plastic bags, and hand sanitizer. These are all from the commissary. They give them to you every time you have a food pickup. We would also tuck the deuce of spades in here in at least one of these packs. We'd have two or three of these for the crew. And then if anyone along the trail, hey, I gotta go to the bathroom, give me the poop kit. Poop kit had the shovel, the hand sanitizer, and the toilet paper in there. The plastic bags we actually used for sorting out food for people who didn't bring the big clear Ziploc bags They're for their food pairs. We used these plastic bags and then wrote with a Sharpie on them whose food it was. So each morning they could just grab the right bag and go. All right, and I like keeping this kind of towards the top also, because if you need it, you need it in a hurry. Also in here, um, this is my Big Agnes Fly Creek HV2 Platinum tent. It's a very small, lightweight two-man tent. And you can see on the 2017 trek, I ripped the bag that came with it. So it's in a Sea to Summit uh, stuff sack, a nano eight liter stuff sack bag here. That was in here. Again, the stuff sacks and bags in here make organization real easy. This was my dirty clothes bag and it has a pair of gloves because we needed gloves for our cons project. So I've got this little pair of mechanics gloves Ugh, and they're still wet. I gotta air these out because they smell nasty. But uh, any dirty clothes would go in that bag and then we would wash them. And I'll, I'll more on that in a minute. All right, clean clothes were in a similar bag. Another Sea to Summit Nano stuff sack. I had the Eco Explore socks from Right Sock, two pair of these, one pair of the Escape socks that we saw earlier. So three pair, that's what I took on the trail. This is a Under Armour insulated top. It's part of their tactical series. They call it Under Armour Tactical XL. And uh, this is the best weight for um, insulation that I have found. It's the warmest for what it weighs by quite a bit. So I, uh, there's a link to this in the best budget Philmont gear article as well. I wore a buff. I've worn these for years, even before 
the coronavirus hit and people started wearing them as face masks. This one is from 10 Cycles in Charlotte, North Carolina. If you like custom motorcycle stuff, so what I would do with this is, uh, Honestly, what I did most mornings, I just put it on like this as a hat. I would sleep in it like this instead of taking like a knit cap or something. The cool thing is if my head got a little hot, I could pull it down so it's open on top and vent a little bit, or I could uh, pull it down and cover my face and ears and neck if that was getting cold or getting too much sun. So I really like uh, to have one of these on the trail. More two more pairs of underwear, separate tech, and some Russell Athletic. I think they called these uh, Cool Max or something like that. Anyhow, synthetic, do not wear cotton because it gets nasty when you sweat. Three pair of underwear, wearing one, carrying two. Three pair of socks, wearing one, carrying two. That let me do laundry on the trail. Here's the other pair of underwear. And then a second T-shirt. You saw the first one was the Troop shirt. This is another My Trail Company ultralight backpacking t-shirt. Just a super light breathable <laughs> t-shirt for the trail. Not cotton, avoid cotton. And then My Trail Company backpacking shorts, They're basically running shorts. These have a uh, tidy whitey type underwear on the inside. I don't like that because it leaves space uh, where my thighs can rub together and cause chafing. So I'll wear the longer boxer brief, synthetic boxer briefs under these. And they don't have side pockets. So if, if you think you'll need those, be sure that you take shorts that have side pockets. So that's what I had for my regular clothing. And then I had a bag, again, in stuff sacks, in Sea to Summit nano stuff sacks that are waterproof and a little bit compressible my warm clothes so i had synthetic long underwear some poly long underwear um, that worked really well and uh, another buff i actually only took one buff on the trail let's see and then this is uh, a wool and poly blend vest that i got at the tooth of time traders a few years ago that actually uh, while i think it's ugly uh, it is really warm for what it weighs and uh, after weighing several different options, I thought there's no way this is going on the trail with me again. It, it was lighter than anything else that kept me that warm, so that went on the trail. That was it for my insulation. If I were to go again, instead of these thin poly long underwear, I'd have a little thicker, more fleece type long underwear because it got pretty cold there a couple times. I'm not sure I'd change anything else with that. All right, other stuff in the pack, I had additional battery packs. So you saw the little white, 10,000 milliamp hour pack I carried in the hip belt for the camera. This is a 26,800 milliamp hour battery pack. I've got the link on the Gear Report Best Budget Backpacking Gear for Philmont page. I barely used any of this. I used the little 10K milliamp hour battery pack to charge my GoPro batteries a few times. And then uh, one of our adults, Scott, had an Anchor 14 solar panel that when we had a few sunny days, he was charging my GoPro batteries for me during the day. So we did that for a couple days and then I used my little white battery pack the rest of the time. Only thing I actually used this for was letting Scott and one of the other adults charge their phone off of it once or twice. And that's it. So if this was extra weight, I didn't need to carry, but it was there if I needed it. And I also had a couple spare batteries for my, oh, it's not out here, my Black Diamond Ion headlamp I put it in my pocket when I went to scout camp to see my kids last night because they're on staff at our local scout camp. So that flashlight is in the house, not out here with me. Just a little black diamond headlamp. You'll find a link for it in the article. And here are my two spare AAA batteries that I did not need. I bought the expensive Energizer Ultimate Lithium. They lasted the whole trek plus, you know, pre-trek and base camp, post-camp and base camp and walking around scout camp last night with it and they're still going strong so i didn't even need the spares i kept those down here in the main compartment just because i didn't need to get to them very often so it was easier there this big two gallon or two and a half gallon uh, ziploc type freezer bag is what i use for laundry so when i had some dirty stuff i'd drop it in here a couple drops of camp sud put some water in zip it up shake it knead it get it all nasty dump it out, refill with clean water. This is the rinse cycle, right? Dump it out, 
then take the stuff out. And you dump it in a sump, by the way, or well off the tra trail and away from camp. Then when it's done, wring everything out, hang it up over a clothesline. Um, I didn't take the clothesline. Some other people in the crew had that, so we didn't need to duplicate and have me carry that as well. Last thing in the pack is the Sea to Summit Event compression bag. This is a stuff sack with compression straps on the outside. I actually ripped one of these off right here. This little joint for the strap broke off and I had to use my sewing kit to sew it back together. In here, I kept a few things just for organization and simplicity. Instead of having a separate bag for my air mattress and uh, my sleep clothes, so I had a long sleeve shirt to sleep in and a pair of gym shorts to sleep in. All right, so those were in here. I had my Cedar Ridge Outdoors top quilt. It was made for hammock camping, but it worked just great on the trail at Philmont. It's a 20 degree bag, custom printed with our Gear Report logo. So thanks to the folks at Cedar Ridge Outdoors for putting this together for me. It worked great on the trail. It has these little snaps at the bottom so you can open it up and have it just like a blanket or fold this in to give you a little bit of a foot box. And you can cinch it up or open it if you want more or less ventilation around your feet. This worked pretty beautifully. This is using their insulation. I thought it was a joke when they first told me, oh, you're allergic to down, you should try up. I was like, aha, real funny, clever calling it up. But no, that's their synthetic down alternative insulation, they call it up. And that's what this is. And it worked really well. It compresses down almost as well as down. It's just about as warm as down. It's very, very similar to down, but I'm not allergic to it. So thank you so much Cedar Ridge Outdoors for putting that together for me. In the same bag for organization, I had my inflatable air mattress. This one is by a company called Chuga. It's uh, some Chineseium stuff off of Amazon. Uh, this is a little bit under a pound and uh, you know, inch and a half, two inches thick, so it worked well for what I needed. Blew up pretty easily. This uh, came with a pillow, an inflatable pillow that had elastic strap on it. I'll put some pictures up so you can see what it looked like out in the field. But this blew up and then strapped around the top of the mattress pad so it didn't slide around. And then I had another inflatable pillow that I blew up to set between my knees because I've got some lower back issues where I need another pillow between my knees to keep everything aligned properly on my spine or my back hurts in the morning. So these are probably three ounces each and a little bit less than a pound. So for a little bit over a pound, you know, uh, approaching you know, a pound and a quarter, pound and a half, I've got a good air mattress and a couple of pillows and then about two pounds for the top quilt. That's a pretty efficient sleep system. And we had some nights that got pretty chilly, close to freezing when we were up in places like uh, Comanche Peak. So it did pretty well. I got a little chilly uh, in, in a few occasions and uh, you know had to rely on putting an additional layer of long underwear or something on. I am a big fan of the Snug Pack Jungle Blanket as well, but that, if you're going later in the summer when it's warmer, I think you can get away with that and some long underwear. If you're gonna go in June when it is a little bit cooler, then you may need something with a few degrees lower of a rating in order to be sure you don't get cold at night. But that completes the sleep system. And uh, I think that's everything. So let me know what questions you have. I wanted to also show you from the crew gear, we had a tarp. Now a tarp, Philmont will let you use the MSR Thunder Ridge tents. The Philmont issued tents. It's a two-man tent that our scouts used. All the adults brought our own tents. All the scouts used the Philmont issued tents because they weighed about the same as what the troop tents weighed. And those scouts didn't have lighter alternatives on, on their own. so. They used the Philmont tents and it worked out okay. They're a little heavy at about six pounds each, but you know it worked for them. They also offered the Thunder Ridge tarp or dining fly or rain fly, whatever you want to call it. Ironically, this troop happened to have the exact same tarp that I have, my sportsman's guide. It's a kind of cheap uh, polyester uh, tarp. 
Um, I have modified <laughs> mine with some extra tie-out points and a bottom ridge line, so we took mine. I recommend this is one of those areas where the current Philmont issued tarp is lighter than what they had a few years ago. It used to be an easy win, you know, carry their eight pound tarp or bring one of your own that's three pounds. Well, now their tarp's probably two and a half, three pounds. This is probably about two pounds, maybe a little over. There's not much weight savings here. Not that big of a deal. If you don't have a tarp, don't go spend a ton of money unless you can get it closer to one pound. Then you've got less than half the weight of the Philmont one that they'll let you use for free. So don't go spend a hundred dollars on a tarp if you don't need to. But if you want one like this, there will be links in the article on gearreport.com for best budget Philmont backpacking gear. All right, one other item that we took in crew gear, Philmont has you carry big four or eight quart uh, aluminum pots on the trail. Welcome to Clark's Four. And I think that's kind of silly. It's actually something that, that Steve Nelson, the uh, director of camping at Philmont, saw me in base camp, saw my Ask Your Crew Leader shirt, came up, started talking, and then he's like, oh, by the way, I have assigned someone on the ranger staff to review all of our gear and process recommendations because it's been 20 years since we've done that. And a lot of technology and backpacking practices and gear have changed in the time being. And we think, you know, we could probably do some things better. So I may get involved with that project with them. I certainly volunteered and I'm hoping to hear from the, the ranger in charge of that. But since he mentioned, you know, technology evolving and backpacking practices and gear evolving, here's something that's changed. We now have heat exchanger pots that are a whole lot more efficient at heating water. Most of the dinners at Philmont have a rehydration requirement. You know, you, you get this dried stuff in a bag, you have to boil some water and pour in with that stuff to rehydrate it. What they're using these massive pots for at Philmont in their cooking method is basically just heating water to rehydrate dehydrated food. Why would you use a big pot with huge surface area that's very inefficient when you have a heat exchanger pot or a jet boil pot that has insulation on it that will heat water so much more quickly with less fuel use and uh, you save a lot of time. So we had an occasion where the, the crew, while I have very well-documented uh, problems with the Philmont cooking method, the crew that I went with this time chose to use the Philmont cooking method anyway, <laughs> which, which is kind of funny, uh, but it was completely the, the crew and the crew leader's choice, uh, not the adults. So they did what they wanted. We supported it. They were doing the cooking anyway. We got to a camp one day where we were running late and really needed to make up some time so as they're getting the big pots out, I said, okay, humor me here. We've had a backup stove and a primary stove. We're using only one stove and this big pot that has massive surface area that takes forever to get the water heated up enough. Why don't you use this? Use two stoves, run the main one and then run this one on the side. This is gonna get the water hot so much faster. You'll be able to have the meals done a lot quicker. And they looked at me skeptically and said, no, we're two stoves, we're gonna use twice as much fuel. I said, well, no, you're not because you're running them for a shorter amount of time. So they did it and our sister crew was beside us. They were there when we got there, they already had their stoves running. We heated our water, rehydrated our food, the exact same meals. And uh, we were even done with cleanup packed on the trail before they were eating because the Philmont method with those massive pots takes so much longer to heat the water compared to a heat exchanger pot with a lid on it. And this isn't even a jet boil with insulation. I mean, this is just an aluminum one liter. And we had to do this three or four times, but that was still quicker than doing one big pot the Philmont way. So I highly recommend that you look into some heat exchanger pots like a jet boil pot or this Ollie Camp. Again, there's a link on the gearreport.com article for best budget Philmont backpacking gear. We also had a windscreen from an MSR Whisper Light uh, that we no longer use. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk about is we used canister stoves instead of white gas stoves, isobutane canister stoves, because of a history that I've had at Philmont where anywhere else I can use my Whisper Light stoves and they run like tops, no problems whatsoever. But every time I've taken a white gas stove to Philmont, I've had issues with them clogging and not working properly and requiring too much maintenance. So 
I believe, based on how well they work everywhere else and how poorly they work at Philmont, that they have some issues with the fuel supply because Philmont supplies the white gas. Some contamination gets introduced somewhere in their process because we have pretty persistent problems with white gas stoves at Philmont but not anywhere else. The isobutane canister stoves, you don't have those issues. Plus, I had another crew advisor on the trail telling me at one of the camps that one of their scouts knocked over a white gas fuel bottle with the lid off and they lost a whole bottle of fuel. So you don't have that with the canister stoves. They're sealed. You can't get contamination in them. You can't knock them over. You could puncture them, but you, know, you could also puncture a white gas canister as well, I suppose. They're easier as well. I wanted to show you the little stoves we used. I'll put some links in the article so that you can go on Gear Report and see what stoves we actually used in the field. They were like $30, $40 a piece Chinese knockoff canister stoves and they worked beautifully. One of them had a little uh, piezo ignition system so you didn't even have to have a lighter. You just turn the gas on, pop the little button and boom it's, it's lit as compared to a white gas stove where you've got to fill the fuel bottle and screw the pump in and pump it up and flip the thing this way and hook it up and then uh, prime it to get some fuel on the outside and light it and let it pre-warm and burn that off and then try to light it without getting a huge flame or catching the woods on fire. Whereas the isobutane canisters, you screw it on, you crack the valve, you hit the button, boom, it's lit, it's going. No risk of burning the woods down and it's easy. So a lot of different advantages, I think. I think the isobutane canisters are the way to go at this point. 20 years ago, maybe the blends were different. They didn't work as well at altitude. Today, they work fine at altitude. We had no issues anywhere we went. They worked like champs the whole time. But we had to ship those back via uh, US Postal Service, and they have not arrived yet. I would show them to you but they're, uh, they haven't been delivered yet. So maybe tomorrow they'll show up. That's the gear I carried on the 2021 June trek. It started on June 18th. It was a 12 day trek. We came off the trail. Would that make it the 29th or 30th? Something like that, the end of June. Um, that's the gear we used. If you have any questions about any of this, please go check gear-report.com. Look up our uh, Philmont budget backpacking gear article or leave a comment in the description or uh, go join the Philmont Trek Talk group on Facebook and ask questions there. Any way you like, ask your questions. We'll get back to you. Until next time, we'll see you on the trail. Let us know if you have any questions in the comments. A big thanks to our patrons for helping us bring you more unbiased, hands-on reviews.